Welcome to the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is the Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister with this congregation of people of all ages and at all stages of life. Whether you have come here for the first time or the 300th time, whoever you are, wherever you come from, whatever your accent, whomever you love, whatever your religious beliefs, you are welcome here. You are welcome as you are. Our tradition is one that embraces heresy, a word that means choosing, to choose. Ours is a faith that affirms that we need not think or believe alike. Our aspiration is that we would love with a similar spirit. And by that, we mean not just with a, a warm feeling, but rather with a real and tangible effort to care for each other, to care for the world. We affirm that every person is worthy and that every person deserves love. And we are firmly committed to this world and to the struggle to make it a paradise here for the living. And that same spirit of love calls us to fight for human rights and to be good stewards of this earth, to respect the relationships of which we are a part. And in that spirit, we recognize that this is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They were here long before the first, the first English came down the Illinois River. And so we take a moment in our service to honor the Peoria people for who they were and for who they are today. I want to thank folks for joining us, whether in person or online. If you are new, please, by all means, grab a name tag and talk to one of our ushers. We love all the questions, so ask all the questions. And I invite you to stay for coffee and conversation after service in Fellowship Hall. If you're with us in person, there's also a little chat on the Zoom after service as well. And if you are new to us, if you have a family, um, young children, if you're new to us, you can see Jesse Lachlan for a uh, religious educator um, for information. New visitors are welcome to keep children in the sanctuary with them. Or you're welcome to come and check out our program when the children and youth leave during the service. And now I invite you to check your respective devices to see if they are in worship mode, Thank you, uh, whether buzzy or, uh, buzzy or silent for this moment. We have a certain tech ministry, so don't be shy about asking for help. And I have a couple of notes for this morning. One, I want to welcome, we have a special guest. Uh, Selena Pappas, who is joining us from Central Illinois Friends. Yay! Thank you, Selena. Thank you. Thank you. She'll be talking about uh, some kind of things to keep in mind in our current concerns about HIV and AIDS in the spirit of World AIDS Day. But also, uh, this afternoon is an event, um, World AIDS Day Candlelight Vigil. It'll be 3 p.m. at the George Washington Carver Center uh, downtown. So please keep that in mind and please go and encourage your friends as well. So we have a couple of notes for upcoming. We have, so now it's December. So we have all the holiday stuff. It comes, it comes. So next, yeah, yay. So next Saturday, next Saturday is our Deck the Halls, 2 to 4 p.m. All ages are welcome to make ornaments for our sanctuary uh, Christmas tree that I think is going up this afternoon. Uh, there'll be hot chocolate. People can sing carols. And every year, I kind of love this, every year the kids try to outdo themselves on how long a paper garland they can make. So let's, let's top it this year. Can we, can we do that? I think so. Um, see Jesse Lachlan for information. Also next Sunday, the service will be... Uh, a Christmas pageant, one of the no rehearsal kinds, but they'll be making costumes and props today for the education program. Uh, and everyone is invited. It's an interactive, interactive event, and everyone's invited to participate either from, ta from their seats or by joining the tableau that will be created up front. Right. And now let us continue into our service. Oh, but let me just say, check out the newsletter. We have a world of things, wonderful things happening this month, so please don't miss anything. And let me invite us to rise in body or spirit for our opening hymn, number 347, 
Gather the Spirit by UU musician Jim Scott. It's in the gray hymnal if you like the music. Please be seated, and let me invite George Hopkins forward for our opening words. Good morning. Grace meets us where we are by Reverend Gretchen Haley. There is nothing you need to bring with you to be welcome. No right beliefs or proof of citizenship. No eternal optimism or clarity of conviction. No boundless courage or endless experience, or expertise, sorry. <laughs> you do not need to know what brought you here or how you will solve that problem you are turning over and over and over in your mind. Your bills do not need to be paid, and your checkbook can be a mess. Your children may have been up half the night. Your hearing aids may not be working, and your knees may be creaking. 
You do not need to be already perfect or even halfway there to be belong in this circle where grace meets us where we are, but does not leave us boundless, boundless. <laughs> where love resides in each of us, yet is somehow more than all. Where life still pulses and rages and heals and transforms, creating us and this day anew once again. Come, let us worship together. And I'd like to invite Bill Ordaz and Tim Harold forward for our chalice lighting. We light this flame for World AIDS Day by Lori Chlaban. We light this flame for those who have gone before, for those who acted up, for those who marched, for those who wrote songs, letters, manifestos, for those who fed and sheltered people, and for those who buried the dead. We light this flame on World AIDS Day, honoring those who have died, remembering the many living with HIV and the many children orphaned by this disease around the world. We light this flame for hope, love, in action. Flame on. (laughs) Let us listen deeply to what is on our hearts. Let us listen to what our fears are. Let us listen to the young children. Let us listen to the teens. Let us listen to the elders. Let us listen when the world is sick. Let us listen. We set aside this moment for reflection, for centering ourselves, and for refreshing our presence in this community for all the reasons that bring us together. All are welcome during our music for meditation to come forward and light a candle. And for those who are online, we invite you to let these candles be for you. Let us enter into our music for meditation. Thank you. 
from the Reverend Susan Manker Seal. Much of ministry is a benediction, a speaking well of each other and the world, a speaking well of what we value. Honesty, love, forgiveness, trust. A speaking well of our efforts, a speaking well of our dreams. This is how we celebrate life through the speaking well of it, the living the benediction and becoming as a word well spoken. This is the time of speaking of the joys and sorrows of the congregation. I have a couple of notes of thanks. First to Vicki Huerta, who decorated our altar for the month of November, and to Holly Green, who created this bright tableau for December. They coordinated the handoff of that yesterday after the memorial service. I want to thank everybody who was part of the potluck Thanksgiving dinner on Thursday. We had almost 50 people, and there was plenty of good food and spirit. People took to heart my, hey, I'm not sure if we have enough food. And you all turned out, and it was great, and cleaned up, which was even better. I also have a little note of thanks to Biller, Daz, and Tim Harold for doing a quick cleanup of the side of the road yesterday morning before Larry Matthews' memorial service. We looked much better, I'm just going to say. I have a couple of notes of care. Uh, one for Marty Roloff, uh, wishing her a speedy recovery as she is getting better after a recent uh, hip replacement. She is doing well, and she seems to have all the support she needs, but we just hope that that continues to be the case in the going well. We send wishes for health to Lucy McRae. Uh, she is in the hospital um, getting checked out after a fall, and she is in good spirits and is eager to get home. Very typical Lucy, yes. We had the privilege of remembering and celebrating Larry Matthews yesterday. Uh, that went very well. Folks were here. The family was here. And I think people just really enjoyed the chance to remember and just share wonderful stories about Larry. Uh, and thank you to the Caring Committee. I have to offer a note of gratitude to the Caring Committee for and all of the volunteers who assisted with not one, not two, not three, but four memorials in the course of November. We had one nearly every weekend. What a gift, I will say. What a gift to be able to offer such care to the family and friends as they mourn and cherish their beloveds. It is a good thing that we do. And I also offer one more note of sorrow from Gary Hall sharing with us uh, John Michael Grow, that he passed away from a heart ablation. He was, John Michael Grow was a very great friend of all veterans, of all veterans. So we offer our condolences to all who knew and all who appreciated the good work of John Michael Grow. Now I invite us to share one more moment of quiet together, one more moment of pause in which we simply have to be here and breathe. I invite you to breathe with me.
Shalom, Salam, Namaste, and Blessed Be. Now, for today's story, I get to be the one to tell today's story. And it's called The AIDS Quilt. I put it together for today. And this is a story about getting sick, being scared, and angry, and sad. And it's also a story about a lot of love. Now, our human bodies are amazing. We have phalanges. We have veins and things that kind of make the body work. Oh, if we breathe in the air and the oxygen gets in, we are just being is spectacular. And our bodies even have ways to defend itself against diseases that could hurt us for a while, like a cold, for example, or the flu, or some diseases that can be very, very serious for us. But sometimes, every so often, a disease surprises us, and it scares us. And then people study it to find medicine and a vaccine to help keep us from getting sick. And we've done that most recently with COVID-19. And we are learning about that still. And still, some people are becoming ill and some people are still dying. And this is also some partially just the nature of this illness, too. Two of the people we remembered this year from the congregation were folks who had died of COVID-19. So it is still very much with us. But the disease I'm thinking about today showed up a little over 40 years ago. This was a different virus, HIV, human immuno, immuno okay, we're going to try that again, human immunodeficiency virus. Now, having HIV meant that a person's body couldn't defend itself against even the usual things like a cold or a flu. But also, having HIV meant that unusual diseases might show up, things that really don't normally affect folks with a strong immune system, with a strong body defense. And when this started to happen, people didn't know why or how these diseases were appearing, and they were scared because people became very sick and often died not long after they became ill. Again, this is a little over 40 years ago. And the problem was actually even more difficult. And this was happening around the world, but the problem was even more difficult in this country because the people that most often became sick first were men who loved men. And not long after they found the same symptoms in the people, uh, even though they not long after they found the same symptoms in the people who needed blood transfusions to be healthy, but the people that first showed up with this illness, this mysterious, they were calling it something of a, of a gay cancer at that time, were like, why is this happening with this particular community? Now, eventually they found that anyone could become sick. This wasn't just one people, one kind of people or another. But anyone could become sick. But before they really figured this out, because the first people who were sick were the men who loved men. Well, people thought it was okay to ignore the illness. Because more than now, people thought that men should love women and women and not men, and even more than today. Now, we know a lot better now, and people, many people knew better then, but a lot of people were scared and afraid of this illness. So when you have this kind of judgment and something that's scary, this was a bad combination. Some people who thought 
that men shouldn't love men were some of the doctors and the people in our government. So this meant that it was even more difficult for people with the illness to get the help they needed. And the people who became ill were often isolated and abandoned by their family and sometimes by their friends. And sometimes they had no medical care and then they would die alone and in pain. Now many people did come together and care for the people with HIV. A little love and compassion went a long way for people in the last months of their lives. But eventually doctors and leaders started to take the disease seriously and study it, and especially after they accepted that anyone could get it. But so many gay men, transgender people, and more died before they had good medicine. And people had to find a way to remember and celebrate the people they knew, the people they had heard of, and even to find a way to remember and celebrate total strangers. Because they knew that every person is a whole being with dignity and should be cherished. So they began, some folks began to take large squares of fabric and decorate them with people's names, with pictures, with flowers, with music, or anything maybe a little bit about that person before they died. And they sewed those pieces into larger squares, like this one. This is part of the AIDS Memorial Quilt. It is block number 1333, and you can see this remembers eight men. And you can see the hearts, and that some of them loved pets, and the dates for some of their, uh, when they were born and when they died, far, far too early in life. This is part of the archive of the AIDS Memorial Quilt. And then they started to put more and more of these blocks together. Volunteers were doing this. AIDS is what, was, what the disease was called, what happened when people with HIV became ill. But then they had so many blocks, so many thousands of people, who were being remembered, that the quilt became too large to show anywhere for people to see, except in a place as large as our National Mall in Washington, D.C. Now, the mall, the National Mall, runs from the Capitol building, as we see in the picture, I think at least to the Washington, the, the Lincoln Monument. I think it's about a mile. Somebody can correct me. And it is a vast, it is the vast kind of national lawn, if you will, of this country. In 1996, people showed the entire quilt as it was for the last time in its wholeness. The quilt covered the total length and width of the mall and more. They kept adding, they had spaces where they kept adding pieces of the quilt during the show. Thousands of squares. 50,000 squares. Thousands and thousands of names. The quilt was too big to see all at once, ever again. It was and is the largest community arts project in the world. And I went there. I went in 90, 90, 1996 down to Washington, D.C. with my friend Cynthia, who's also a minister. She's one of our excellent Navy chaplains. At the time, we walked among the squares, along the rows and the aisles between those big blocks. But there were many more people who never had people to make a block for them. 
the quilt volunteers still wanted to have a space for every name that could be found. So every so often amidst the prepared squares, there were open squares and pens available. And people could write on those open squares, respond to the quilt, respond to their feelings, um, express, talk about the people that they were remembering in this moment. So people could add names. And I added a name. In my extended family, a person who was gay became infected with HIV and died of AIDS. I was very sad at their death and how they were treated. There wasn't much I could do. But the one thing I could do was put their name on the quilt. And now that meant that they were not alone. And their name would be included and treated with respect. Somewhere, there is a photo of me adding the name to the quilt. I hope to find that photo again. But I still remember being there and feeling so heartbroken and so filled with love at the same time. Because it was such a profound, massive expression of love. Today, the medicine and treatment is much better. And people are living and able to have futures. We still struggle with HIV and AIDS and how people are judged for who they love and for who they are. I so appreciate that the AIDS memorial quilt is a sign of how we can care for one another, even in the worst of times. I wonder, I wonder how you show care, even when things are very, very hard. Now I invite the children and youth and the adults to go to the RE wing for their program for today. Let us sing them out. The offering we receive each Sunday is an opportunity to recommit to this place and these people. It is as much a ritual as singing together, as lighting our chalice. It is a reminder of that form of love we call generosity. It is how we show that we believe it is important to worship together, to help our community, and to say yes to the values of our faith. We also take a portion of that abundance and we share it out into the world through our Share the Plate program. Half of the undesignated uh, collection goes to our monthly recipient. And so for this month, being the first Sunday in December, I want to share that our December recipient is the Central Illinois Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired. They provide support and encouragement to the blind and visually impaired since 1955, the staff teaches Braille, helps set up households, trains and provides assistive technology, and offers many other opportunities, including social, out, social connections and outings. So one half of our designated offering will go to the Central Illinois Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Uh, the ushers will pass the plates. Please use the donation uh, Please use the envelopes to designate where the donation should go or use the QR code in the order of service. And let me invite the ushers to please come forward.
As part of uh, preparing for today, what, I reached out to Central Illinois Friends, see if we could get uh, some good words about World AIDS Day, and I want to invite Selena Papas to come and join me up at the front. We'll hear a little bit about what we should know. Right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me into your church today. I really appreciate it. Um, a little bit about Central Illinois Friends, for those of you unaware. We are a sexual health clinic located in downtown Peoria, and we are also opening Peoria's very first LGBTQ community center sometime this winter. Uh, exact date coming soon, hopefully. <laughs> so... Um, when Jennifer and I were, were talking, she asked me to talk a little bit about what you should know. And I think what I'd like to talk, what I'd like to start with is why, why the organization is called Central Illinois Friends. So back in the 90s, J. Martin Sills, who at the time was an openly gay man, and um, several other gay men in Peoria came together and they noticed what was happening to their community here. People were becoming infected with HIV. They were being ostracized, kicked out of their homes. And they said, that's not right. So they bought a little piece of property downtown. It, it was an empty building with a cot in it. And their first, the first person that they helped was this 19-year-old young man. He was dying due to complications with AIDS. And they brought him in. He's laying down on the cot. And they asked him what do you need? And he looks at them and he just says, I need a friend. And he would pass away later that evening. And so what, what do you need to know? What, when coming away from that story, what I ask you to be is a friend. Um, living with HIV is, is very isolating. It is, despite all the research that has gone into it, a disease that the average person knows very, very little about. And so we at Friends, we really do our hardest to educate people. Um, but what you can do as, as the everyday person is, is you can be someone's friend. You can be the family, the friend that they maybe don't have. Um, that, that's across the board and you know, compounded by the fact that some folks living with HIV have other marginalizations that they're living with, be they LGBTQ, be they women, be they a person of color, right? And the stigma that that carries can make your life very, very lonely. And we're social creatures as humans. And this is a beautiful service that was put together today surrounding World AIDS Day. I hope you'll all join us for the vigil later this evening. It's a beautiful service. Um, I am not a public crier and I cry every year. So I hope that you'll come join us. We have some great speakers who will share their stories as well. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful holiday. And yeah, go out there and be someone's friend. Thank you. Will you please turn to hymn number 348? Guide my feet, rise in body or spirit.
Please be seated. In 2018, the movie Bohemian Rhapsody succeeded as a biography of the stunning gifts and the struggles of the late, great Freddie Mercury, lead singer for the rock band Queen. Woo! There we go. As portrayed by the fabulous actor Rami Malek, Freddie, in the course of this story, explores his sexuality, his understanding of himself, as his musical vision and talents emerge. Central to this story is the appearance uh, of HIV and the AIDS crisis. His death from AIDS-related illnesses in 1991 spurs one of the most important AIDS awareness movements of the world, of the world. Now, watching that movie took me right back to growing up while hearing the news and watching the world respond to this frightening and devastating illness. I was a teenager when this was showing up, and I was in college when Freddie died. My roommate and I were weeping at the news of his death, and not just for his death, but because of everything it implied and it was connected to around HIV and AIDS. Now, since watching the movie, I have wondered about the generational impact of the AIDS crisis, the stark illustrations that have gone around of how many people died. You might have seen the photo of, I think, the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus with something like 100 or so men in black and a mere handful in white, showing how few survived the crisis. But there's also itself the AIDS Memorial Quilt with, with 50,000 blocks and more. But there's also the story of those who lived, the people among the many stories of the people who took care of the ill and the dying. Those folks themselves are coming into their later years. Some of those stories also I will offer live with some of the members of the congregation who were part of that care. That service, that service to these people who were just so alone and so ill and so frightened, it mattered at a time when people were abandoned and cut off from families and from just the fear of the disease. Now, one of the pieces of legacy that emerged was also in that time being able to have, what we had to have, was a more frank conversation about sexuality, about politics, about control over one's body and life a more explicit conversation about love and expression, and this was a good thing. It was a powerful reminder of humanity and our diversity, along with the innovations in health care and treatment that came from the urgent need to try to reduce, to reduce this illness. We in this time are in our own moment of decision, of daily decision, about how we live our values, about what our larger calling and moral obligation is in a conflicted social and political moment. As we live in year five of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are in the fifth decade since the start of the AIDS epidemic. Our systems and care and medicine are much improved for HIV and AIDS. So much that people are not necessarily taking it as seriously as they once did. And it's still something you don't want to get. And it's still the case that the most vulnerable in our society have the least access and are at the most risk for infection 
and death. But I want to talk about some of that legacy, some of that, how we have shown up in that kind of moment, how we showed up in that moment in particular. Because one of the things we can point to in Unitarian Universalism is how we, in many ways, did show up. And simply as a matter of responding to circumstances based on what we value. One of those stories is around my colleague, the Reverend Dr. Kim Crawford Harvey. She was a brand new minister in 1984, 1985 and found herself having to respond to the moment. One of the safer places for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, asexual community is in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Now Provincetown, if you know Cape Cod, if you think about Massachusetts, Provincetown is, here's the Cape, here's Provincetown. It is a protected bay. It had been a, uh, had been, still was at that time, a Portuguese fishing village. It is a beautiful setting for a vacation as well. It's where my family would go on occasion too. And I think the distance from the world, because it's way out at the end of the Cape, the distance from the world made it a safer place for people who needed that distance. And there was a Unitarian meeting house that had been there for quite some time. And that, in that moment in 1985, a new minister came, Kim Crawford Harvey. She served the people. She served everyone. She welcomed everyone. She performed weddings and memorials for people who had been rejected by their families for whatever reason or by their churches she found that to be the case in some of the Portuguese community as well. And she and the congregation were a safe place for the gay men and for those who loved them amidst the growing AIDS crisis. So she started there in 1985. And I think in the course of that, received a recognition for being citizen of the year for her work. Now, she left that ministry in 1989 for a ministry in Boston at the historic Arlington Street Church. And she continued to be that presence. She is one of the most pastoral, spiritually grounded presences I think I've ever known. She only just retired from Boston this summer. She just retired. 2024. And she is, of course, a fully human person. She is not perfect. But she's been a model for over a generation of how to show up, how to care, and how to keep pushing us to show up, and how to hold our faith, our values, and ourselves accountable for providing more justice and more healing in the world. The story I want to share is hers from the one story she was sharing uh, in the UU Rainbow History Collection, which is online, you can check it out, from those AIDS years. And she shared one specific story. She says, I'm remembering my Provincetown parishioner, Paul Richards. Paul was a big, blonde, mid boyish Midwesterner, with the energy and exuberance of a Labrador retriever. Yes. On his own initiative, with his Baptist heart, Paul recruited new members to the meeting house by inviting groups of six friends at a time to Sunday brunch in his home. Now, the hitch was that the invitation started with church at 11. If you plan to eat, You had to meet Paul in his pew. 
at the beginning of service. He was shameless and he was charming. Rock on. Now, as you might imagine, Provincetown being a place of beauty as it was, there were a lot of summer weddings that happened there too. Kind of a, a churn of people coming and getting married and it was beautiful and exhausting. And Kim did a lot of this. So she says, one, sun, one summer Sunday afternoon, the last wedding party of the day was being photographed on the front lawn and on a cloudless sky. And Paul popped in, found Kim. And he said, my boat's at the pier. Let's go. And Paul and Kim says she could see the Kaposi's sarcoma erupting from his leg. And Kim was like, I was exhausted, but I went. Paul motored way, way out into the bay until the leaning steeple of the church took its place in Provincetown silhouette on the horizon. He threw the anchor and we sat there in the silence. And from a distance, the dying and death, the loss and the grieving all, all took their place. And then Paul said to me, listen, in all this madness, even if it kills every single one of us and there's no one left to tell the stories, it matters that we love each other well. It matters that we love each other well. And she says, among the many lessons of the plague, I cherish this. Sometimes if we're very lucky, someone shakes us awake and reminds us to pay attention in this very moment. Paul Richards, presente. And that's the story that Kim chose to share. So I invite us, I call us, let the history in the moment wake us up. I know we are weary. I know we are weary. I also know we are strong. The history, the history that might embitter me the history of politicians and choices and biases and terrible, terrible losses. That history is also here because of love. Love chosen again and again. Humanity chosen again and again. The politics and leaders that chose a lesser risk or let some folks fall away because they were not worth considering, they need to be reminded that all are worthy. They needed it then, they needed it along the way, they need it now. By all means, we should rest and refresh and take those moments. As we have been hearing people encouraging folks to do in the weeks since the election, in the time since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, in all this time, it's always been there. And so, by all means, take a moment to pause. And then, and then, choose love. Know who you are, as my colleague Connie Goodbread says. Remember who you are. Remember whose you are and what you value. And we can carry forth. We will carry forth as the advocates in the line of this great legacy of human service and doing the right thing because we are committed to putting love into action. 
The work of the generation is ours. Let us go forth. Amen. I invite you to rise in body or spirit and join me in our closing hymn number 1053, How Could Anyone? We will listen once and sing. Distinguished Italian, Blessing for Hope on World Day Day by Maureen Cloran. It has been a long struggle and our work is far from over. As we go forth, may we be empowered by the spirit of hope and healing, whose one name is God, whose other name is love. We carry the spirit as found in our flame, even as we extinguish this light of service. May the blessings of love be upon us and within us. May love's truth be upon our vision. May love's wisdom dwell in our hearts. May love's persistence inspire our lips. May love's gentleness give comfort to our bodies. And may love's gratitude accompany our sleep. May love's healing be a balm for our brokenness. May love's serenity give peace to our weary souls. May love's confidence energize our minds. May love's challenge keep us faithful. Faithful in struggle, faithful in conviction that love and justice and hope will ultimately prevail. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin.